Welcome. This is our last event for our Your Fork, Our Planet event. We've had two weeks full of all kinds of activities, and this is the cherished one for me because Lanny, who is a friend of mine, has agreed to come and speak to us in person. And she has two, um, I'll talk about all about her, but she has two books. She came actually two years ago. She did a phenomenal presentation about her Quit Fit Quickies book. And then now she has recently published The Plant-Based Journey. Both of these books are available up in the atrium from the bookstore, and she will sign books afterwards. Um, so that's a rare treat that we get to have an author that's here to sign. Now, Lanny is um, a teacher. She is an adjunct faculty member at Butte College up north. And she has become a huge leader in the plant-based movement. And the way that um, the way that I describe Lanny is she has all the pieces put together. So her book with the Fit Quickies brings together exercise, nutrition, and the mind. And she's always cognizant of those three pieces. And this plant-based journey has had such fantastic response and she can go into this a little bit more but this is one of those guides that answers questions that everybody has about how do you how do you go through these transitions with our your fork our planet events cowspiracy was the what 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 do we need to do lanny is the how okay so we know what, we know why, but how do you do it? How do you navigate through these changes on your own journey? And Lanny meets you where you are, no matter where that is. A lot of my students are just awakening to this concept of plant-based, just putting those words together in a sentence. But Lanny takes you by the hand wherever you are and brings you forth. Now, she has the degrees behind her name, of course, but she's also, um, I will read this because I want to make sure I have it correct, Certified Specialist in Behavior Change. So that's the real focus of this book, is making changes that stick, and we all can identify with that. She's also a um, certified plant-based, she got a certificate from E. Cornell in certified uh, as a certified plant-based nutrition expert, and she does mindfulness meditation instruction. She has that certification. She's also spent quite a bit of time on the other side of the camera for TV. You may see different um, episodes of Good Day Sacramento, and she's been on several different uh, CBS TV, ABC, Prevention, USA Today. She's been featured in the Huffington Post, even the Saturday Evening Post. She's also, you may recognize her from the 21-day kickstart, PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Many of my students went through that program, and she's featured in there. You may recognize her face um, there. And she's also, um, this, this book is a phenomenal book, and it's been recognized by Veg News as the top media pick of 2015. So you have so much to share. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you, Lanny, for being here. I will bring these back up to the bookstore table. <laughs> Were you taking those? <laughs> Thank you, Tim Marie, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I am so excited to be here. I just love coming to your college. And who did I see when I was here a couple years ago? I recognize a couple of familiar faces. Well, I am here in the capacity of a change, change specialist because I want to first say what an amazing week has been put together for you, or two weeks, right, by, um, by Professor Hagenberger and Christy West. Where are you? I want to recognize her hard work and your, your entire staff. I mean, you've had the talk about the food, and you've talk, had the talk about the environment, correct? Who went to Cowspiracy? I asked earlier, and good, we're going to refer back to that. And as I said, I'm here in the capacity of behavior change specialist, because sometimes, do you ever find this is true for you, that you find there's something you want to do or some change you want to make? And then you're over here, and maybe there's a little bit of a gap. Have you ever had that experience? <laughs> and no less in the, the area of 
changing something as fundamental as what we put on our plate. So I will, I'm here to share with you that there are five universal steps of transition to sustaining plant-based nutrition. Now sustainability is key and that's why I'm so excited that I was drawn in as part of this sustainability idea. But before I get to those four, five steps, and I'll tell you where I got them and what they are, I'm betting that even with a group this size, hi, that we are all over the chart with where we are in terms of simply getting more whole plant foods or more vegetables on our plate, right? We probably have some people who maybe call themselves vegetarian. We might have some people who eat a vegan diet. We might have some people who are trying to just get more vegetables on their plate. We may have people who are starting to move more plants on their plate and move animal products and processed foods off. And we might have people in here who are just thinking about this. So I'm betting somewhere in there, I see people nodding their head that there's a connection there. So this is what I would like to do before we go any further. We have this commonality. We have all heard about plant-based nutrition. Is, can I say that safely? Okay, <laughs> so we've all had that idea. What I'd like it, everyone to do right now is I want you to think back in time when you first had the idea of making shifts in your life in this most fundamental way by what's on your plate, adding more plants and less of everything else. Now maybe it was someone you talked to, maybe it was a teacher you had, <laughs> maybe it was something you read. I want you to think back, and it might have been a period of time, there might have been several things that kind of converged to give you the idea, so do you have it? Can you find it? Okay, what I'd like to do is real quick, just without raising your hand, I'd just like someone to pop up here and in 10 seconds just tell me what that moment uh, was or that confluence events that gave you the idea of just having more plants. Can someone just pop up? No hands? Just pop up? Yay! <laughs> you can come on up here. We gotta get you on the microphone too. What's your name? Or Efrain, it doesn't really matter how you pronounce it. But um, I have to say roughly the second or third week of Hagenberger's nutrition class, uh, simply because the first week it was more introductions and I was really, really adamant, really kind of stubborn and like, ah, this is probably, no offense, but it was the first week. It was just, I was like, ah, this is bogus. This isn't going to work. But the more, bogus the, is the polite yeah, word. yeah, we'll <laughs> go with that. Uh, but uh, the more, the more I learned, the more I actually, you know, opened my mind to Maybe this is a possibility. Maybe this is, uh, this can work, you know. And I'm more than happy to try it out. Wow. Well, and so what's yeah. The, the, the most impactful connecting point, or is it too hard to pinpoint? Uh, it's a little little difficult to pinpoint, but I would say the fact that less processed foods and uh, processed food and animal products reduce cancer, uh, simply because my my father uh, two years ago did pass away from cancer, and I um, uh, really just want to whenever I do have children or whenever I get a child, um, I want to be there for them. Um, unfortunately for my dad isn't there for me anymore. I think my mom is, but um, yeah, I, I want to be as old as possible to be around my children for as long as possible and my children's children, so. So you had a real personal connection, huh? Thank you, let's thank, oh, hold it. Yeah, don't go anywhere yet. I want to thank you for helping me get my lesson started today. So here's a copy of the plant-based journey for you. <laughs> and be sure to have me sign it after class. Thank you again, yeah. So we just, he just helped me present in a beautiful way with a personal connection how we all start on the first step. As you've probably guessed, the first step of the plant-based journey, the universal is awakening without having someone given you the idea or that you read something or that you went to a class, something had to inspire the idea or you wouldn't even think of doing it, right? So that's the universal first step. And there are three primary reasons that people shift to eating more plants and less of everything else. So let me share with those three for you. And they're drawn from the research and they're also drawn from personal experience. The first, as Ephraim, did I say that well? 
I do my best <laughs> to, um, he talked about the health reason. This is probably the biggest reason that people shift to plant-based nutrition or eating more whole food plants. And for me, that was, I had all three of the reasons I'm going to share with you, but that was a big driver, and that was health. Now, particularly with my weight. Now, people suggest to me, they say they find it hard to believe that I had a weight problem, but I did. I'm the one on the left. And it doesn't help that everybody in the picture is skinny. But actually, I have been, I started as a vegetarian 43 years ago, so before birth, right? It was, you know, quite a long time back. But, and it progressed from that, but it was still plant-based, even though as I shifted, I gave up all animal products except for dairy products, and, I, and that was it. You know, I gave up eggs and meat, and this was a long time ago, probably when your parents were, I don't know. <laughs> but we, this was before we had all these wonderful plant-based products on the market. There wasn't like vegan ice cream and, you know, it was just you had to eat whole grains and beans or, you know, that was kind of what you went with. But even within that, without going down the avenue of the whole foods, which makes a huge difference on your ability to find your naturally healthy weight by eating to hunger satisfaction with whole foods because of the fiber, it's a struggle. So I struggled for 30 years with my weight up and down, even as a vegetarian. And I do go into this in the plant-based journey. Many people I know can relate to that. And the, the health issue and the weight issue is a big draw. So what I did is, um, I had to connect with my origins as a person who has a genetic predisposition to easily gain and have a hard time losing weight. Now, maybe some people can relate to that. So in this picture, I'm the one on the right with my skinny sister on the left. Don't you hate that? <laughs> but so this, this uh, has been with me for a while. It's uh, easy for me to pudge. But the whole foods plant-based lifestyle has shifted that in such a wonderful and delicious and easy way. And now what we have is, this was me probably in 1998, and that was 15 pounds down from my highest weight, which was what, 189.5. That 0.5, very important. <laughs> and, and over the course, this is 20 years ago then, that I've kept off 50 pounds. And it's because of the three pillars that Professor Hagenberger was talking about, the food, the fitness, and the frame of mind that I weave all the way through the plant-based journey. And, even in my Fit Quickies book, I had to put in the food and I had to put the frame of mind. So I like to put the pictures up because it does give you a picture, a vision of someone else's situation. But it's not just the weight. It is also cancer preventative. We know that animal products proliferate cancer cells in the body due to IGF-1. Have you heard about that? Do you talk about IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor? And you know, today my real mission with you is to talk about the transition, but I want to underscore that the awakening and the reason you do what you do is very important. It's the single most important step of the plant-based journey that you want to stay connected with, why you are making this shift. And in the awakening chapter in the book, I go into the health reasons and the other reasons in a way that will allow you to springboard and do even more research from. So the other reason for, uh, besides health is, did we turn this off? Okay, is uh, for the lot of the animals. Some people come to eating plant-based because they've heard about the horrific conditions that animals face in factory farming. And I don't know if you know this gentleman. His name is Gene Bauer, and he is co-founder of Farm Sanctuary. And up in Orland by Chico, there is a farm sanctuary. And the mission of Farm Sanctuary is to provide a place for animals that have been downed on the farm or some maybe escaped from a slaughterhouse to be able to live out their lives as a being just like you would like to. So this is a very important draw to the plant-based journey. And also, I wanted to let you know, I have a very personal connection with this part of the plant-based journey. My husband and I started in the 1980s traveling all over the world as volunteer field biologists. We started with working with sea turtles on the beach in Mexico and Costa Rica, and we've just gone 
everywhere, um, and most recently to Africa to work with the animals. And I don't know if you've heard about the David Sheldrick Wildlife Refuge, but who's heard of ivory poaching and it's a problem for the animals? Okay. It's, it's heartbreaking, and we've adopted several animals at this shelter and have gone a couple times. We're going back again next year. But this is a way to connect with one of the most urgent needs that is out there, connected with how we eat, because land, there's a big conflict between wildlife and humans because we all want it to eat on. And the human population, have you noticed, is kind of growing? Have you heard about that? <laughs> so the, the conflict really comes to a head in these places. And um, our work with wildlife continues. We just got back from Costa Rica. And we had the advantage and the privilege of staying on this 400-acre prime rainforest estate by one of the gentlemen who works at the Smithsonian Institute. It was right up on the beachfront, um, beautiful big trees. There was. Scarlet macaws were nesting outside our shower window. I kid you not, going to be washing my hair and the macaws are coming in. It was just wonderful. But then we also did some rainforest reconnaissance. You've heard about how the rainforests are be cutting down so that the cattle can grow, so that beef can be shipped to China or America or wherever. And so on our expeditions, we would leave the rainforest area, the primary, and there would just be acre after acre of cattle growing country, and there'd, there'd be a wildlife preserve, and we'd ask the biologists, um, how's this working in a sustainable way? But you know what? This whole sustainability thing, we have to think of how it, who it's sustainable for. It, it needs to be sustainable, certainly for the wildlife, but if the idea of just sustaining cattle ranching until it drives all wildlife off the planet wildlife off the planet is going to be problematic. Anyway, this is one of the big problems, and I have a personal connection. Uh, the other is continuing on with the environment then. I'm going to move right from the animals because they're connected with the environment. Do you recognize these folks? This is James Cameron and Susie Amos Cameron, um, the, the film director and producer. They have been very supportive of the plant-based journey which I'm thrilled, they, we had some interview time and they endorsed the book. And whenever you get someone with a big name leading a cause, do you think it makes an impact? <laughs> so I'm really excited to see that they are now champions for the environmental aspect of changing to a plant-based diet. They actually have started a private school now down in Southern Cal in Malibu, of course. <laughs> and it's, uh, they've just gone 100% plant-based, plant and the kids grow their own food and all of that. But the environmental concern, you know what, of the three, health and the animals and the environment, sometimes I think maybe the environment is the most important one, because if we don't have it, we can't be healthy and the animals can't exist either, so, you know. But they're all three important. They all three drive my personal choice and the work that I do. So you've heard about livestock's long shadow, you know, from probably from hearing Dr. Openlander speak that 50% of all of our land water goes to raising the raising of livestock in our country. And people go, come on, cows aren't that thirsty. But we have to look at the big picture. It's for watering the feed that they eat. It's for getting the equipment cleaned. It's for transporting them. It's a big use. And for some reason, we hear all this. Have you ever heard, been heard turn off the water while you brush your teeth? OK. That, has, that can't even touch the impact we can make by choosing broccoli over beef or chickpeas over chicken because the land use and the resources are so much less and we still get fed well. I tell you, here's how I look at it. If we can eat in such a way that doesn't have such a strong impact in the environment, that makes us healthy, that's absolutely delicious and varied, and doesn't hurt some other creature? Well, why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we do that? So therein lies the transition question. How do we get from here to there? Awakening is the first step. The second step that I've got is scout. Now remember, I told you these are universal five steps. So you want to hear how I got them? Yes? <laughs> they, these are a result of my observations on my own experience. The personal coaching, I've been doing this for a long time and have coached thousands of people in this transition. And while I was writing the plant-based journey, I interviewed and surveyed 
over 1,200 people who had made a successful transition. Now, by that, I meant they'd been living successfully plant-based for three to five years or longer. I said, what do you wish you had known wh when you got started? What would you like to tell someone else that would help them along? And their results informed my manuscript and I have their stories all throughout the book. Don't you love that when you can read someone who's gone down the trail in front of you? Um, so that is where I derived those five. And it's true that everyone who has had sustainable success has gone through each of these five steps. The scout stage is once you've had your awakening and you think, OK, I'm going to do more of this plants thing. I'm going to try to eat a little bit of less of that. Or maybe you've just, excuse me, decided to make an overnight change. The first thing you, the next thing you gotta do, gotta do is find out what is on a plant-based plate. What do I want to eat more of? What do I want to eat less of? How do I set up my kitchen? What's on my shopping list? There might be a lot of change. There might be just a few shifts. But you've got to get these essentials. And this may be one of the places where people fall short fastest. Maybe they got all inspired with a lecture, or maybe they went to this weekend where they had really great plant-based food fed to them, and they go home and go, well, I'm going to eat like that. But you know, someone does have to prepare it, and someone does have to procure it. But it can be very, very simple, and I'll tell you more about that as we go forward. So that's the scout stage. You've got to get the basics. The next stage after that is rookie. OK, this is the fun part, because this is where you get to eat, all right? Now you know what's on the list. You kind of got your kitchen set up. And then you get to try it all on. So a rookie, who's a baseball fan? Yeah, semi? <laughs> but we all know what a rookie is, isn't it? I always connect it with baseball. Do you do that too, connect with baseball? Because that's when you step up to the plate. You try it out. Now let me ask you a question. This is very important. Does the rookie, every time at bat, hit a home run. <laughs> no. Sometimes they hit a foul. Sometimes they pop out. But do they leave the team? They keep honing their skills and come back. And the reason I make this point is because people tend to think, I'm going to have to become this gourmet cook. I'm going to have to get it all perfectly. And none of us can stand to that tall order. And so we tend to we cr collapse under the pressure and don't move on. By having the rookie attitude, you just keep eating more of what you like. And this is how I have set this up. And we're going to show you a video clip in just a minute. But I want to give you a little more background information. Here's a great way to look at it, is to take the foods that you already love and plantify them. Many of us already enjoy foods that are actually plant-based, like spaghetti with marinara sauce, or bean enchiladas, or the taco bar. Have you seen Professor Hagenberger's new book in the bookstore, The Foodie Bar Way? Man, you'll recognize all the foods that you love in there. Who doesn't like potatoes, and tacos, and beans, and avocados, and you know all of these foods? So think about it. Can you think of like one food that's, all, that's a plant-based food right now? Yes? I'll take that as a yes. Um, then from there, I will, and this is all in the book too. Once you have those, maybe you have some foods that are a little, have a little bit of animal product and you want to figure out how to make the transition. So that's what I call as plantifying your plate by just putting more vegetable foods and more plant foods in the foods that you already love. You start to budge your taste a little bit. So this is one of the segments I did just a couple months ago on Good Day Sacramento about plantify your plate. And I thought it'd be fun to show you. It's just a five minute clip since I don't have a cooking thing here in front of me, so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. That's coming up. <laughs> Feel the kale head. Need some snacks. Oh. This is probably not going to work out. <laughs> Hi, Manny. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that um, Professor Hagenberger was on Good Day Sacramento like last week? Did you see it? Foodie Barway. <clears throat> OK, that'll probably work. Okay. Yeah, and remember, it doesn't need to stop. Yeah, OK, I did. I did put the shrinky on the. <clears throat> yeah. 
So I'll just click the middle button on the top to get drag it down to size. Okay. So we'll talk with the author of a new book that could teach us strategies for adding greens to your meals. That's coming up. <laughs> Feel the kale head. Need some snatch. Oh. This is probably not going to work out. <laughs> Hi, Lanny. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Okay, now the Thank last you. time you were here, uh, you played around with us. We, we did some quickie exercises. Yes, we did. We okay. worked on fit quickies, and right. everyone was such good spirits. I, I'm so happy to be back here because you guys are so much fun. Well, welcome back because you always have good stuff. So oh, aside from you. us eating cereal and pancakes today, <laughs> you are coming to tell us about this cool book, Plant-Based uh, Journey. You're going to plantify our plates. Yes, quick tips for how to plantify your plates mm -hmm. because, you know, no matter where you are on yes. the food continuum, everyone knows we need to get more vegetables and Absolutely. Whole in our diets. So I like to start people there. Whether you're real experienced with doing that, there's some quick, easy way, or brand new, there's easy ways to get more plants in your right. plate, all right? So I have a few examples here. First, what I wanted to tell you is I make it, I'm a very lazy cook. So you I like, like to, yeah, <laughs> I like to get in and make it quick so I can get okay. to the good part, which there you is go. eating, eat and it, it yes. has to taste really good. Okay. So for my first example, I have taken simple brown rice, mm -hmm. or any kind of rice that you like. Okay. How can you get it so you get more greens? We all know we're supposed to have more whole plant Absolutely. greens in our diet. Well, here's what I do. I cook a pot of rice, okay. and then I'll chop up some Napa cabbage. Oh, I And see I open a can of mushrooms and slice up a little kale and then just toss it in. Look at that. While Very the easy. rice is still hot, okay. so it wilts the greens quickly. Got it. So sometimes you don't even know you're eating a green, and you can kind of work your way up from there to getting more greens in your diet. Okay. And you can use anything. You can use this beautiful Napa cabbage, mm -hmm. and, or you can use kale. We but love if kale. you find this daunting, guess what? We have in a bag in love little it. pieces, so you don't have to feel like you chop. You can use regular, you know, you can use spinach, right. all kinds of things. Then we have to, the, you can do the same thing with pasta. Yes. Cook up pasta and notice I cleverly did part white pasta, part mm -hmm. whole wheat. Because if you're oh, trying I see what to you move did there, you grain, sneaky lady. You no, know, if people are trying to move to whole grains, right. they go, I don't like whole grains. Well, do half and half for a while. Change your taste slowly. And you can, I fold it in spinach mm -hmm. and olives to this. Okay, now this is going to be my favorite one the, uh, oh. the bulgur wheat. I know a lot of people have heard of bulgur wheat. Yes. Some people it's, have not, but they don't necessarily know what's the purpose of bulgur wheat. In this, wheat. oh yes, in this bowl mm -hmm. of chili. This is actually called Game Changer Chili, and this oh, recipe okay. is in the plant-based journey. Right. Most of my ideas in the book are templates, which are just ideas like this. Throw right. things together. In this, everyone loves chili, right? Isn't that a universal? Absolutely. And I have done the same thing. I've cooked the chili and then folded in some spinach, okay. and then if you're trying to move out the animal products yes. and move out the meat, I have replaced what might be ground beef in here with some bulgur wheat. And so, it really it looks like like short grain brown Yeah, rice. it does. It does. When but it has it. a really good nutty taste. Mm -hmm. So I just cook that into it. And this took three minutes to, to cook in the pressure cooker. And then I folleted kindy beans. So, Boom. yeah, here's some bulgur wheat That's dried what like before it's put in. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, now tell me about these muffins. Because we uh, like little things that are quick. Grab it. Go. Yeah. All right. Here, this is plantified. Who doesn't love cornbread? The perfect right. match for the chili. What I have done is I've plantified cornbread by just chopping up peppers, mm -hmm. green, yellow, orange, red. I put in whole corn. Here's here, the peppers. Here, let me move these out of the way. Who put, did Ken put that in? Ken is oh, all Rudolph. sabotaging well, the you set. needed a little extra mm -hmm. kick. Let's see if some ended up in the muffins. <laughs> See how you have all this beautiful oh, color beautiful in here? Color. Yeah. Mm. And it just makes festive and fun, and you have plantified your plate. We all know the benefits of having more plant foods in our diet, so lots of ideas, lots of ways to go. And proof is in the pudding, because take a look at her picture. This is Lainey's picture, uh, a little before and after. Now, do you mind if I, if I let her friends know your age range? Not at all. You can do my exact. Your exact? 63? 63. 63. No, making that up. Stop right? lying. So, right? Stop it. What? Right right now, you're lying. Look at those legs, darling. <laughs> Well, yes. let me tell you, this is a difference. And I was a vegetarian in this earlier shot. Yeah. But when you think of incorporating more of the whole foods yeah, and moving away, even processed mm -hmm. things, then you have a whole different way of satisfying your hunger so you can be full without being fat. And who doesn't want that, right? We love that. We love that. Listen, her book has been
been number one since July for newbie books coming out, especially in the in the vegetarian category, and the people behind her yes, uh, that exciting. are writing her forward and stuff, very uh, influential people, and they know what they're talking about, so if they like it, we should like it too. Thank you. Yes, Good stuff. Thank, thank you, you. for coming in. Appreciate it. so much fun. Oh, Ken? I forgot one other thing. Oh, what's that? What did I do this Yeah, time? I brought um, dessert for everyone here, of course. Yay. Wait, I've got Is some... Is that chocolate? Chocolate cherry truffles for cast crew Whoa. and everyone here. That's because, awesome. Yes. You can I've come got, back. Do they I've got kale? all kinds of have kale in them? Do they have kale? Oh, is there kale? No, I put it in cherries and chocolate and walnuts, but we got a whole food that. dessert here, and I've got a whole thing for the holidays with yummy pumpkin nut muffins. Oh, and we'll have you back. Yes. Come back. Yes. All right. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you got some ideas there. And you know, I know there are a lot of people who are already skilled at this, but one reason I like to present this idea of plantifying your plate, because maybe you're in the position of helping someone else along. And it's very important that we come at this kind of change in a positive way. And that we use humor and that we use connection with the people that we know. Did you notice the Fruit Loops there? <laughs> You wouldn't believe this, you guys, but earlier in the show, you know, the show was just like five hours every morning or something. I don't know how they come up with that material. But they had done a segment of making pancakes with your kid's favorite breakfast cereal. So they were going, who wants sugar smacks and who wants Fruit Loops and who wants Cap'n Crunch? And they'd put him in the batter and, you know, make pancakes. So that was actually my idea to keep the Fruit Loops on the table because you see how it caused engagement and fun. And I don't want to be that... The, the grouchy plant lady who comes in and shakes her finger at you. I want to be the person who invites you to a good lifestyle. And another thing that's really important that I've already told you that I taught sixth grade for 20 years and I still teach at um, Butte College, where, by the way, Fit Quickies is a required textbook for a kinesiology course there, which I'm very excited about. But as a sixth grade teacher, if a student came to me and they got an F on their math test, which of these two ways do you think would be more likely that would encourage the student to improve their math skills and grade? One, if I said you can't get an F again. Or two, if I said, you know, I know something about how you could get or a B or an A and I could help you with that. Would you like that? And which of those two ways do you think is going to have the more positive response from a student? It's pretty clear, isn't it? So that's the, the way that I work from, is really building upon the positive. Another thing about, before we go on to the next stage, oops, how do we get to Rockstar? We're still in the rookie stage, by the way. You probably wonder what Rockstar is all about, which all of you are, of course. But in the rookie stage, she mentioned, I mentioned the templates in the segment. The templates are, this has been like the runaway hit of the book. The, the templates are simply take this vegetable, take that vegetable, take this broth to cook it in, and put the seasoning on it, and vary those as according to what you like. Put it over some grains or potatoes and add this for a day. It's just very simple. This is how I cook. So my, <laughs> my publisher even said when we had our first uh, planning meeting for the manuscript, he said, you know, these templates are really, these are really good. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know, that's just the way I cook. So. I don't know, because I'm a lazy cook. You heard me say it, right? I want it so it's easy to put together, but it's absolutely delicious. It has to take good. So there are several of the templates in there. I've got several kinds of burgers in there and Buddha bowls and the, um, just one thing, the savory vegetable template. And the other thing that's really important in the rookie chapter that I have is some meal planning ideas. You may have heard, I don't know how much reading you've done in the plant-based nutrition, but there's a kind of a, th a way of thought out there, especially from the doctors, and they'll say, you know, all you need to do is eat from a variety of whole plant foods and you'll get all the nutrition you need. Well, that may be true. But if I grew up with, and maybe this is like your experience, my mom would make, you know, a main dish, which is usually some kind of combination of starch and protein, chicken and rice, or tuna casserole, or something like that, and then a vegetable, and then a fruit, or a vegetable or two, and then a fruit. But she planned meals like that. Does anyone have that in their experience? Like that was kind of a, you know, a square meal or something. So to ask someone to just, 
abandon that is a pretty big cliff to jump off of. So what I've done in the plant-based journey is taken that basic plan and I just plantified it so that instead of chicken rice, it was uh, bean enchiladas or lentil curry over rice or something like that. So it's a real, that's been a real lifesaver for people because people get really nervous. I have this framework of my meals and how am I just supposed to you know, jump off of it? Another, another comment that I want to make for you is I've even heard a plant-based doctor say, you just have to for, kind of forget about everything you know about nutrition to, and just make a change. Un unlearn, that's the word to use, unlearn. Well, guess what, as the teacher, I put my foot down at that. We don't unlearn anything. We learn by making connections with what we already know with some new information. Just like I explained with the meal, easy meal planner, that's the way to look at it. You don't need to, un unless we get brain damage, then we can, un can unlearn. But otherwise, you just make um, new connections. So the next stage after the rookie thing, all right, now you've gotten good at home. You know how to prepare easy breakfast, lunch, you know, all that, dinner. You're good in your home environment. Now, what about taking it out the door? What about the workplace? What about travel? What about social situations? What about family celebrations? Has anyone ever encountered a little uh, challenges between what you eat and what the rest of the kid eats? Well, there, this is again where I drew heavily on my surveys from people over and over again of how they handle those challenges. I have several ideas you can just practice and take with you so that you can still have a congenial visit with your friends and your family and have a social life, but still engage in your preferences and what you're doing for your health, what you're doing for sustaining a healthier planet and for all of the reasons that you're eating more whole plants and less of everything else. So that's a rock star stage. And I also have uh, several family stories in here. There are three families I profiled who transitioned their families to whole food plant-based, including one group that had three tweens, the three kids came along, and they told their, all the details of their, you know, the tears and the challenges and the triumphs. And then I had the teenagers also write their stories. It's very informative, like we were saying earlier, to have modeling from someone else. And the fifth stage is champion. Now, that may sound like it's a really tall order, like it has a big checklist and you have to do all these things right. But actually, this is the shortest chapter in the book because at the champion stage, all you do is keep practicing what you're learning at the other stages. Does anyone here do martial arts? Yeah, what is your martial art? Oh, Taekwondo. All right, so is your, um, then do you go to a dojo to study? Okay, so when you go there, and everyone knows what a dojo is, right? It's like a place where martial arts are studied. And when the master, the sensei or the teacher, goes to the dojo, does, what does he say when he goes, I'm going to go down there? Does he say, I'm going down to put on a big show or I'm going to perform? What would be the terminology? I'm going to do what? Well, practice. I'm going to practice. And that is how I see this. That is how I see my role as a teacher, too. I'm always practicing. And there, that way, there's no perfection here. There's no um, black or white rigid wall that you can crack and crumble against. You just practice. Thank you, and get better and better. Um, so that's the champion stage. Now, these five stages are also backed up by what I call the key supporting players physical activity, and mastering strength of mind. They're really important for making change. Sometimes people say, gosh, should I fix my diet or should I fix my exercise first? Have you ever heard that? Or <laughs> someone complains about it? And I say that they are interwoven together. I'm going to start with the exercise and we'll talk about the mindset mastery a little bit. How are we doing on time, boss? Good. Oh, perfect. Oh, perfect. Because I won't have plenty of time for any conversations after a question or answer, because you know, teachers, we love Q&A. <laughs> when it comes to physical activity, most of us think of exercise. What, who are the fitness enthusiasts in here? Who likes to move their body? <laughs> okay, I was on, I, was, I just got back from Texas, where I was presenting at a big festival down there, and they put me on this panel of the um, athletes panel. 
you know, and my expertise is in fitness, but I was up with these, you know, marathoners and ultra this and ultra that, and I just, you know, like to go out in the woods and run, and I ride my bike every day on the flume and the dirt, and I said, well, you know, I really kind of call myself a fitness enthusiast, so don't feel like you have to be an athlete to be doing good with your fitness. But most people think when you exercise that you're maybe burning some calories or getting a strong, stronger muscles or getting a stronger heart or, you know, getting a better figure, strengthening your bones. And exercise does all of those things beautifully. But this buries the lead at the real benefit of physical activity. You want to guess what that is? It's what it does for your brain. As soon as you start putting one foot in front of the other, there is a biochemical cascade, and you're probably familiar with this, that takes place in your body. There's a release of hormones. Serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, and these mix with a protein in your brain called BDNF. Now let me tell you what that stands for. You may already know it, all you enthusiasts. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor. That means the ability to create new neurons and new connections in your brain. The minute you start moving, this series takes place. So do you think making new connections in your brain and learning, being able to learn new things as far as your brain process goes might be important when you're looking at lifestyle change? It's huge. As a matter of fact, I venture as to say that if your feet are stuck in cement, in other words, you're not moving your body, your brain's stuck there too. You cannot make lifestyle change nearly as effectively as if you simply go out on a walk every day. You don't have to do, be an um, athlete. You can be a fitness enthusiast. <laughs> Just walking every day makes a big difference. So why would you overlook something so easy as that, so simple, to help facilitate lifestyle change? Has there, is there anyone here who honestly can say that after you exercise, you don't feel better and more optimistic and more energized? And then, yeah, OK, yeah. It's, it, we just know what goes with it. And it doesn't ha I have lots of ideas about how you can just work in exercise. I have what's called a metabolic profile because has anyone ever found themselves sitting behind a computer like four hours later, it's whoop, whoops, where'd the day go? It's easy to do, isn't it? But the dangers of sitting too much are tremendous for our health. Plus, it sticks your brain in cement. So here's what we're going to do right now. You didn't think you were going to get to my uh, presentation without a little bit of physical activity, did you? Okay, I just want everyone to stand up where you are. We're just going to get a little circulation going, wake up the brain. You know, it's kind of early afternoon, siesta time. All right, we're going to do fit quickie number 10, which is legs into play. Very easy to do where you are. I'd like you to put your heels together and turn your toes out, kind of like, uh, what is this, first position if you're a dancer? Um, hmm? If you're a ballerina or ballet guy, but you just have a 90 degree angle, uh, angle at your heels. Okay, now getting correct in anatomical alignment, pull your abdominal wall in and up, give your glutes, your backyard a little bit of a squeeze so you kind of bring your pelvis into alignment, roll the shoulders back, extend the top of your head to the ceiling, now lock your legs completely straight. And this is called legs into play because what you just did was brought all the muscles of the legs into play. Are your legs straight? Is your backyard tight? I'm not going to test. And I will not ask people behind you to test. So, okay, here's what we're going to do. Keep everything in line and just start tapping your heels. So what we're doing is pumping the calf muscles. The, the calves are what is known as your peripheral pump. In other words, they're moving the blood and lymphatic fluid up out of the lower extremities through your heart and into your brain so you get some oxygen in your brain. Now stop. Get your alignment again. Get your legs straight. Get your backyard hmm, tightened up. Come up to the toes and down to the heels. Up to the toes, to the heels. You feel a little bit in the calves? You're giving it a squeeze. Let's do four more. And three and two. Last one, then let's turn to this side. We're gonna stretch our legs. So we're gonna take our right foot back, left foot forward, just into a little lunge position, and pull the back heel off the floor, then push it back down. Do you feel the stretch in the calf? I'll take that as a yes. Then change to the other side. Yeah, let's go this way. Left foot back, roll the heel off the floor, push the heel back, 
and step on in and float back down into your seat. You have now re-energized your brain. <laughs> Congratulations. That this thick, quickie concept, I have 14 exercises that if you go through each of them through the course of a week three times, you get a complete strength training workout for your whole body. This one I like is because I call it an instant invigorator. You get that circulation to your brain and you counter the effects of sedentarism. Have you heard that word? Sedentarism, it's like uh, what they say, sitting is the new smoking. It doesn't take much to counter it, but sitting for long extended periods of time, and we were kind of at 40 minutes, which is kind of my outside range for get up and just do something as simple as that. So you should feel re-energized and brightened up. Lots of ways you can just sneak in activity through the day, but my main point that I want to make with this today is any kind of learning, any kind of change that you're making, let your body be a part of it because it will help you along enormously. And we're just about to talk about the mastery of mindset, which is something that is tremendously important to everyone and dear to my heart because as a physical educator and someone involved in nutrition for a long time, I still struggled for many, many years with getting it all together. And it was the mindfulness and the mindset mastery that allowed me to finally integrate these into a change which has become what I teach now and has allowed me to sustain a, a, a nice, good weight loss, but not just that. We want happiness. We want freedom. We want to eat and enjoy what we're doing. We don't want to go through looking at life as weighing one thing against another or tension or it, all this around food. Food is meant to be relished and enjoyed and all of that. And when you can get these components together, it makes a big difference. And when the question of mindset mastery comes in, what does that really mean? I'll just give you a little bit of hint right now. And that is, over the course of the day, we have a gazillion thoughts. Have you ever tried counting them? <laughs> we have something like 50,000 thoughts a day. And we tend to be led by them. We follow their stories. They drive us crazy. Some of them are important. We have to solve problems. We have to you know, bounce the checkbook, and those all take thought. But many times, they're just pulling us one way or the other. And is it possible that sometimes those thought engagements pull us in a direction that isn't to our best benefit when it comes to what we eat? Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> this is where you can find a point of intervention in what your ideal is and what your goals are and what your behaviors are, which really brings a good point in, too, that I wanted to bring up. This is back on the rookie stage when you're trying it on, step up to the plate. What about transition timelines? Maybe you've been thinking that a little bit. So let me ask you, what do you think is the best thing? If someone wants to change to this way of eating, do you think it's the best way is to go over time or overnight? So I'll let you think about that for a minute. And I want you to know I also asked the, my 1,200 survey people, what do you think is the best thing? Should people just rip off, you know, go cold, whatever? Tofurky, we call it, because that's, <laughs> that's a vegetarian turkey. Or should they just, you know, should they just jump into the deep end or should they make incremental changes over time. So I'm going to ask you, what do you think the survey people said? How many people think they said um, overnight? Just make a big strict change overnight. How many think they said, how many people think more people said over time? How many people didn't want to raise their hand? <laughs> I understand that. Remember, I'm a teacher. Sometimes you just don't want to raise your hand. I don't know. Don't ask me to raise my hand. <laughs> so I get that. Well, it's interesting. We had more people who said over time than overnight. The survey results was 50-50. Just as many people said, do it overnight, rip off the Band-Aid, jump in, as those who said over time. But guess what? I got some inside information for you. For all those people who said overnight, in my surveys, I didn't just say, check the box. I said, tell me a little bit about that. You know, elaborate on what you think. Why do you think this? What happened for you? For all those people that said jump in overnight, half of them qualified their answer by saying, oh, overnight, just do it. Um, well, I did this for a while, but I kind of had a hard time with this. So for a while, I did this, and then I started doing this. And eventually, they were all the way there. In their mind, it was overnight, but in reality, it was little overnights over time. So that's kind of interesting. <laughs>
So, and mindset mastery comes into play there too because we do have such expectations of ourselves. You know, we want it yesterday. We're Americans, gall darn it. We gotta get it all right and if I stumble and fall, then I must have done the wrong thing. Not necessarily. You just correct your place, you go back into any of those five steps and move forward. And the other thing I have here is I had to show you some pictures. I do have some recipes. It's not a cookbook, but I told you about the templates. And I've got about a little over 20 recipes that included in the templates, but I also have a chapter called Crowd Pleasers and Can't Misses. Because as I said, the food's gotta taste good. And if maybe you're in the situation of preparing food for others, you go to a potluck, what am I gonna cook? That's where I wanted the sure thing. And this is the portobello pot roast. Who doesn't, didn't you love pot roast? My mom used to make great pot roast. But this uses portobello mushrooms. Disclaimer here, I did not take this picture. My pictures don't come that good. <laughs> One of the, there was a big blog tour when the first book came out and many of the bloggers had made the recipes and posted the pictures and I said, can I use that one? Isn't that great? Can't you just smell it? So I wanna thank her, that's Melanie, for the picture. Um, we also have Game Changer Chili. You saw that in the video. I just replaced the, cr the ground beef or ground turkey with bulgur wheat, which is very, it's just crumbly. It's the same kind of texture, very robust flavor. Pumpkin nut muffins, these are like, I, I, oftentimes I'll be able to make these for a presentation, but these don't have any oil or sugar in them. They're sweetened with dates and they're a huge hit. Oh, by the way, I told you I just got back from Texas. I don't think I told you about this, Timory, but um, in this community, there's a boys and girls club. Is there a boys and girls club in this community, maybe in the Sacramento area? You guys know it, you know, for usually underprivileged kids who just need a place to go, and they had just acquired a food cart to put together as a business, so I worked with them. We used recipes from the plant-based journey, and during the festival, they had their food cart out in the street and they made a pile of cash. Everybody was grabbing these and grabbing the portobello pot roast. And um, so they're all kid friendly foods too, family friendly. That just came to mind. Oh, you saw that already, <laughs> the Fruit Loops. The chocolate cherry truffles are in there. I tell you, this is uh, dates and walnuts and coconut and cocoa nibs and wow, really good. Just a, a variety, mandarin chocolate ice cream. Who doesn't love that? Do you know what that is? It may be, have you had frozen banana ice cream where you just take, put frozen bananas in a food processor? Well, I just added a little orange and cocoa to it and man, got a childhood favorite back. So just to finish with a couple of quotes from the book, eat more whole plant foods and less of everything else. And then this, this thought I'd like to leave you with. Restore your birthright, the pure joy of eating. Food is meant to be relished with gusto, free of overstructured artifice, bodily discomfort, disease, cognitive dissonance, or a looming threat of weight gain. Oh, I'd like to leave you with that. So there we have it, and we have time for some conversation and question now too. <laughs> so any questions or impressions or something about the steps or the survey or um, anything, I'm happy to share from you with my experience, yeah. I just wanted to say I tried that portobello pot roast, it's really good. So I would recommend it. Thank you, what is your name? Judy, did we eat, um, connect before this that you were going to be here? Oh, at the Veg Fest, I remember. That, is that where you got the book, too, Judy? Yay, it was Sacktown Veg Fest. And, um, Professor Hagenberger spoke there, too. Yay, okay, we heard one for the Portobello Pot Roast. Thank you. Yeah, Efron. Uh, personally, um, wh wh which chapter was the most difficult for you to write in the book, or was there any difficulty when writing the book, personally? Was it, or was it just relatively easy for you to put all these steps together? I have never been asked that question, but I love it. I, I tell you what, writing is really hard work because what I wanted from this book is I wanted, what, which is by the way, what has happened. I wanted this to be really positive. I wanted the people to feel, to come away with from every page thinking, oh, I could do this. Oh, this sounds interesting to me. Because so many times you read a nutrition book or a lifestyle book and it's like, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that. And one of the biggest responses from media about this book has been, what's the word? Oh, it's so inclusive. 
um, and it's so, it seems so matter of fact, like, well, why didn't I think of that? Because, and one of the reasons it's gone together like that is because, again, as a teacher, I'm trained in how to take what could be a complex problem and take it apart into doable steps which, so that the student, which is all of us, can progress forward. But back to the question of what was the hardest part, the hardest part was making sure that I had that in place, that I wanted it to feel very positive, that I wanted to bring in modeling um, you know, from other people's experiences at the same time. And it's also very hard for me, probably the hardest thing was keeping it down to, it was like 85,000 words. Like one time, at one point I had to cut 20,000 words. Okay, here again, I'm a teacher, so, and Professor Hagenberger knows this, we like to say things so that all kinds of learners can use them, the person who's a visual learner, the people who's auditory, and the person who feels challenged this way. So I had to figure out, that was the, the hardest thing to do, because I, I had like six or seven great ways to say the same thing, and I just <laughs> wanted them all in there. So that was the, probably the hardest part. Thank you, yeah, great question. I like that. We have a question over here. When you have uh, very stubborn children, how do you do, like, so they refuse to eat your dinner, do you just take it away or, and let them not eat at all? Or how would you kind of resolve that? Good question again. And that's why I invite you to even, um, you can step out when we go outside and kind of glance to chapter rookie and look at the, bringing the kids along. Here's the thing, remember uh, in the family who the parent is. And I, oftentimes I will counsel parents who have this fear of my kids not gonna eat what I serve them. But then we have to look to what is, what is the food in the house? What is the model that you are setting? Are you eating a lot of foods outside of what you're directing your child to eat and hoping that they will do the same because they will follow your lead? They're going to, if they're, if they're hungry, and you have food for them, and you only have quality food for them, do you think they're eventually going to eat? There's going to be the challenge of, if they're used to eating a certain way, I'm not belittling this at all, I know it's, it's huge, because especially if the whole family's been eating a certain way, and now you change, and I want my, you know. Uh, it, it's the, another point of parenting where you have to set the example. And if you set the example and encourage children to eat from a variety of things that they like, I do have some research, what's your name? Brittany. Brittany. There's research in the book called, um, it's about the choice that takes place. When, when uh, there was a, there's the example of a cafeteria where students were directed to eat, they had to get carrots every day. So they were supposed to eat a vegetable. They, the study was done on the group of people that was told you have, have your carrots every day or another s group that had carrots and celery, you could pick which one you wanted. Well, the people who had the provision of choice, that's what it's called, those who had provision of choice ate far more vegetables than those who just had one. So does that mean you have to make a big buffet of vegetables every, you know, every meal for your kids to pick from? No, but it gives you some idea. And this is where um, Dr. Hagenberg, I always call you Dr. Hagen, Timory Hagenberg, also her book, The Foodie Bar Way, is a perfect example of this, where you just put a bunch of foods out, like for the taco bar would have, you know, vegetables and beans and tomatoes and, and the, all kinds of things that you could just pick from to choose. So that it's very important that the children feel like they have some autonomy that they get to pick what they want, but if you only have good foods available, but if you're the person that, you know, the kids are in bed, so I'm gonna have my ice cream, they're gonna know that, and the ice cream's also gonna be in the house, so. Does that help at all? Go ahead and look through the book, you'll get some really good ideas, because those were really, those are front lines experiences, and um, the stories that you will read in the plant-based journey are really informative for that, in that regard. different for uh, males than females? Like, would a female have the same plant-based diet as a male? Or, you know, would you recommend different types of fruits? It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Usually the, the, the guys get to eat a lot more food. You know, the other ones that <laughs> find it easy to lose weight. But no, it's all plant food. And is there any specific, like you're thinking of particular nutrients or is there a specific? Uh, Especially like with a, like a little kid or something, yeah. you know, 
um, you know, they're developing and testosterone, uh, there's yes. a lot of testosterone blockers in, um, in vegetable proteins, you know, so, you know. What, what is vegetable proteins? Like what do you mean by vegetable proteins? Like soy and broccoli and, um, I know that flaxseed does something different, you know, but I don't know exactly what it does. Yeah. yeah. It increases something else, but there's, there's a lot of, uh, hormonal interactions that are more beneficial for women. You know, I'd say it's, you know, that it, it's, it's more important when they're, when they're developing, um, you know, but, um, I don't know. Is there a different? Is there okay, a um, it's really good. I'm really glad you bring up this hormonal thing because when someone switched to plant-based, and because we've come from a standard like a meat-based diet, we get all these alarms about what about the hormones? Are you aware of the hormones that are injected into meat and beef and chicken? That every time we this is why girls are having their menses younger and younger ages, and there are all kinds of hormonal problems with children because of the foods that are in, injected in our our food supply. So if the concern is hormones, you mentioned two or three vegetable pro foods that may or may not, depending on your source, be a problem. But for I'm going to get back to the original question about for children. They just need to be sure that they're eating plenty of food because one of the beauties of whole plant foods is you get to eat a lot of food because it's lower in calories because it has so much fiber. But that makes it imperative that children be sure that they get enough calories. They can eat more of the high-fat plant foods like olives and nuts and avocados and all of those things. And I would suggest that you would work with a pediatrician if you're concerned about that for your own children. For men and women, it's just a matter of calories. When it comes to the protein question, should athletes eat more protein than non-athletes? Well, they need more calories, so they're going to get more protein, right? So it really plays itself out beautifully. Do you want to um, tag on that question since you're the nutritionist? Well, and we, we haven't gotten to, and Chris is actually not in my class right now, but we haven't gotten to the children feeding kids yet in okay. the semester. But, um, but no, that the scare tactics about soy come up every semester, um, and it's unfounded, as you know the um, impact that those phytoestrogens make on our body is actually protective against cancer and it does not reduce testosterone. The, what dramatically reduces testosterone, as we will talk about soon, is dairy. So within minutes of consumption of dairy because the cows are pregnant and they're flooding this body, human body, with those hormones that testosterone levels drop. So that's that's where that is coming in. So good. I, it's good that we so we've kind of broadened the context mm -hmm. of the conversation. And also another thing, one more thing on soy, and then we'll go to a couple other questions. Is that oftentimes what's promoted in the media about soy? They're talking about isolated soy protein powders and highly processed soys, processed meats, uh, and this is just a. a tip of the iceberg of what soy is. Soy is about whole soybeans, edamame, um, tofu, tempeh, all these whole real foods, miso. So I hope that helps out, gives you some place. I know that was your question, but I thought it was an important point to bring up. It would have to be on an individual basis. I mean, you could do a metabolic study, but we do know that we, everybody's body responds differently to different foods. So those types of studies are probably still to be done on huge population levels. I know I can't speak to that at this point, how broccoli affects one person versus another at a metabolic level with regard to the protein and the hormones. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the, the question, because I, I really like to speak to the soy question, too. So thanks so much for coming. I know some people have classes I appreciate. Go ahead. Is your question here? Oh, yeah. I, think, I don't think it works. I think it does. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> okay, um, it was kind of like how her question was about the children, but it's more of like my mom. Like, she's a chef, and I'm at school all day, so do I just, like, throw a plant-based cookbook in her face and, like, here's what we're going to have for dinner. Make it for me. <laughs> so that's why I'm, that's, I'm just like, I don't know what to do about that. So so it's a situation that you want to eat more plant-based, but your mom want mom to do it. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's like the Because she's the cook, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Have you uh, approached the subject with her yet? Yes. She's very stubborn. Um, what's it called? So she... She would, like, she's interested in it, but at the same time, she's like, I don't know how to cook all those things. I'm, you know, she's full Mexican. She's, you know, all, you know, all day, every day is, like, Mexican food. So yeah. And it's full of meats, and, you know, so that's where the hard part comes yeah. in. Because she doesn't know what to do. You know, she's just going to throw that out the window. This is where the plantify the plate idea would come in. And this brings to mind, I remember I told you I was in Costa Rica a couple of weeks ago. And with this house, there was a, someone who tended the property, and she also would cook for us if we wanted to. And we told her we were plant-based. And she's like you, her fan, everything has meat in it. And I said, could you make us some tamales? And she had no idea how to make a tamale without putting meat in it. <laughs> so I just put all the vegetables out here and said, just use these instead. So she put corn and peppers and, and tomatoes and all of these foods and made wonderful tamales. And they were spectacular. So there's a couple of ways you could go. You could, do you cook at all? Do you help your mom out? Okay. <laughs> a little bit? I will try. <laughs> you will try. Well, she probably doesn't work from recipes. She probably has these recipes yeah. that are in her how to prepare. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that you find some way. You could even thumb through the book out there, even if you don't get a copy, and get or from the ideas here about how to move in more plant materials. And get yourself a recipe or two and venture your own cooking so that you can demonstrate that you can do that. Because your mom's going to have to have a, a reason to want to do this. Yeah. You know, I know she loves you dearly, mm -hmm. but, you know, how motivated is she to cook something different for you, especially since she feels a little bit helpless about it because she comes from another tradition. But I bet you eat a lot of vegetables anyway, or no? No, I do. I like them. I, I eat them usually raw, so I don't usually, like, put them with the yeah, food. Just, like, yeah, yeah. Good. If I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I love where your heart is. I encourage you, and it sounds like you're very loving to your mother and want to encourage her down a healthy path. So um, do you want to add anything to that, Timory? Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Thanks. I'm excited to hear how that might come out. You should get my, I have my card here. You can write me and tell me, or I can send you a couple links to some recipes that I think would work well. Okay, someone else? I'll come on over there. While you're walking, when you ask me to add anything, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but as w a lot of students going out to their parents, it feels weird because parents aren't usually open necessarily to learning from their kids. And so when you come from school and say, Mom, this is what I just learned. Everything we eat is going to hurt us. Then that's really hard, right? I mean, it just it feels really wrong because your parents want more than anything to feed you and to have you as healthful as possible, but they didn't learn this when they were in school. And I tell you, when I did my master's program, we didn't learn it. Our brand new textbook doesn't have it, right? So you have to expect that this is gonna be a little bit different and that you go, it, go at it with them, at them with this kind of process where this is a journey and that we all learn. If you're open to new things and you're open to being a beginner, you can learn anything. That's a fantastic quote I heard recently. And so having that idea that, Mom, it's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Let's just try. What's something that you're doing, like the tamales, is Cord's example. What do you mean you can eat a tamale without meat in it? You know, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, what do you mean? Well, of course, you just put vegetables in there. <laughs> but that doesn't even, you know, when she thinks of tamales, she thinks yeah. of meat. And so being able to say, I don't know, let's try it. And you made a great point earlier where you said, sometimes we're going to have busts right, that aren't going to taste the greatest. My kids have been asking me lately, I'm sure, Mom, that you've made something that you didn't like that you threw away. Come on, what was it? <laughs> because I like to kind of, oh, that doesn't, oh, I'll turn it into a salad dressing, or, you know, I'll kind of adapt what I'm using. But that idea that we can have flops, and that's okay. And then it's not bad, it's just good data. I'm just not going to do that again, <laughs> right? We put this and this together, and it did not work. Good. That's okay. But that expectation that doesn't have to be perfect, and that's how Landy's book with the steps, 
that meets you where you are. So in the introduction, I said, Lanny meets you where you are, and she sure did. When she started, she asked, well, where are you? Some of you are e just came from a tri-tip breakfast, right? <laughs> Steak and eggs and sausage gravy, and then others <laughs> haven't touched meat for maybe 21 days, right, with the class. S but everybody can find a place to get a little bit healthier, and so that's with your mom. It doesn't have to be perfect. It can be right where you are. Mama, I love you, and every bite's another opportunity to be a little bit healthier with the new information. What do I tell you guys? When you know better, you can do better. There's no shame in not knowing before, but once you know, it's okay to try and experiment. More questions? <laughs> um, it's just a little question. I was wondering if maybe you knew. Um, I heard that Broccoli actually has more protein than beef. Is that true? <laughs> it is calorie per calorie. So if you think about, if you put a, a certain amount of, of steak on a plate for amount of grams of protein you would have, and broccoli on the plate, calorie per calorie, you would get more protein eating the broccoli. You'd have to eat a lot more food, but you'd also get all the fiber, and you wouldn't get the fat, and you wouldn't get that. You know, I was talking to you, have you guys heard of the book Proteinaholic by Dr. Garth Davis? Uh, and I was talking to him last week, and he was saying, uh, he was at the festival too, have you heard of this book by any chance? He, this is, you'd probably love it, because it's Proteinaholic, it's like we're, our culture it's like, you know, get the, get the protein. Where's the protein? You go to the market and everything has more protein. Oh, throw it in the card. Must be good. <laughs> but he said um, that he goes into a restaurant and he orders like a salad. And I, he's all plant-based. He's one of those I'm doing half marathons now. And, you know, he's a surgeon from Dallas. That writes prescriptions for fruits and vegetables. Yeah, he does. He, he does. has called he a pharmacy, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, pharmacy. So he'll go into a restaurant and order, you know, vegetables and a salad and a potato, and they'll go, well, would you like some protein with that? And he goes, what do you mean? Well, would you like, like, you know, some fish or some steak or something? He goes, well, those things get more of their calories from fat than protein, so you really should be asking me, would you like some fat with that? So <laughs> He's very matter of fact that way. So anyway, yes, it is true, calorie per calorie. And all, the, all plant foods have protein in them. This thing about incomplete protein is a myth that is hard to die. It is simply that some vegetables are higher in some amino acids than others. And if you're in uh, Timory Hagenberger's class, you know all about that. But they're all a mix. Your body can get all that it needs. And I address this in the book. I do not poo-poo that, where do you get your protein question? I noticed no one asked that. Very informed crowd. Do you guys meet before today? Do you get together? <laughs> yeah, because it's a very common question because we're so wedded to this, what protein is, and it's in all foods. So what I did in the special FAQs in the book about the protein question, I'm always happy to answer it, meet the person where they are. I actually walked through a day of my eating, and I measured out the grams of protein in the beans and the rice and the greens and the fruits and the nuts and the vegetables just for the purpose of the cause, and I actually over shot my daily protein requirement with just plant foods without even thinking about it. So it's very hard not to get enough protein unless you're water fasting or just eating two bananas a day and that's it. So thanks for the protein question. I, you brought it in in a new way. What is your name? Melina. Okay. Very creative. Okay. There's one. Do you want to go get her? Somebody's getting their workout into it. We have a fitness enthusiast going up to the back row. <laughs> So I'm in Hangenberger's class, and I t joined Kickstart um, March, and I've been a vegan ever since. But lately, I've been struggling with like, because I like Reese's and Kit Kats and all that stuff. So how do I substitute for like uh, ice cream and chocolate bars? Oh, you said you're struggling with, I missed the word in there. Kit Kat Reese's Pieces. Oh, yeah. Chocolate. Well, is not the 21 Kickstart also that you avoid processed foods and those kinds of things, so you... Or is it like can any kind of candy? Are you not supposed to do that for the 21-day Kickstart? This is the PCRM 21-day Kickstart. Right. So she, yeah, so she did it in March, and so she's still vegan, but oh. she's, she that's talking to her, that's calling her from. Yeah, I understand the room. that. Here's yes. the thing: is one is to be sure that you're eating enough food to meet your hunger and fullness needs from early in the day. Do you have a breakfast by any chance? Are you a breakfast person? Okay. Well, what time is that that you usually? 
I wake up pretty late, but um, <laughs> so I usually like maybe noon, but you know, I've been eating like a lot of oatmeal with apples in it and cinnamon. Okay, and all that stuff. my point, actually you make a good point because when people say breakfast is the most important meal of the day and I agree, but it doesn't matter what whatever time breakfast is, is for you. So if you're out sleeping late and you get up at noon and that's when you're ready for a good robust meal, that's good. But it, again, with the plant-based diet, most people are not prepared with the quantities of food that they need to eat to be able to meet their calorie needs. Because we're used to, you know, here's a little, what, isn't this the size of a meat serving? Something like this? You know, a deck of cards <laughs> kind of thing. Because uh, there's no fiber in it. It's all fat and protein. So when you switch to plant-based, you need to eat from a, a, a fuller plate. Um, so more making sure that you're getting enough beans and legumes so that you have that solid long-term burn and eating enough fruit That is really important for countering the, the sweets and uh, the sugar cravings And if you go long periods of time during the day or try to get through to the next meal by just you know Having a half an orange or something I would say meet the need for hunger whenever it presents itself and in the plant-based journey I also talk about what I call occasional others which means if you feel like you can t can't tell yourself that I can never have another X, Y, Z, then don't. You don't have to say that. You can find a some treat that was is within your plant-based realm and a plan for that. Don't feel like you can never have it, but take care of the problem, which is probably not getting enough natural sugars and sweet, enough uh, calories out actually to the rest of the day and on time. Does that help at all? Uh, yeah, but my mom, like, she has an opinion about a lot, so she's like, what a portion control, think about portion control, you know, it looks like a lot on your plate. And well, let me ask you, and I don't want to get personal here, but um, is there a health problem that you're struggling with? Is there a, a weight situation that you're looking at? What, what's the, then what's the value of that for you? Is that important for you? Um, no, I mean, no problems. Yeah, see, that may, and that maybe your mom does have that. So she might be used to that. And that may be her way of expressing anxiety about you doing something a little different than, oh, she left, um, different than what you're used to. And so by, um, you know, if there isn't a, a problem that you're addressing, then having that heart and understanding where her thoughts are coming from. But that's kind of different than your original question then was the, the sweets. So if you're finding that you're kind of caught in a conflict between not wanting to eat too many portions and that may be hurting you with getting enough to eat, which starts you craving for, there's always a reason. Our bodies do everything for a reason. If we're craving high fat, high sugar, it's either because we're used to it or because our body recognizes it as the fastest way to procure and store extra fat and calories on our bodies. And Lanny, isn't, haven't you seen this as well where this is the only way of eating where you don't have to count? I, I mean, people just, they look at me and think, what do you mean I don't have to watch portion sizes? What do you mean I can really eat as much? As, I mean, they're just stupefied because That's because, yeah, yeah, it's coming from, and it's just like the, mm -hmm. yeah, is that there always has to be portion control. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. So it is, it's a huge shift. When I tell my students, so you have to eat. You know, they're like, what am I going to, well, you have to eat a lot. And well, that's why I asked about if there yeah. was a weight challenge, because right. uh, if not, then it's usually that people are not eating enough. Yeah. If they start craving high fat, high sugar foods, it's because there's a reason your body wants some more fuel, and that knows where to get it. <laughs> more questions. Thank you. She's, oh, yes. Thank you. Okay, we'll do, we'll go for it. I'll come right over to you. You know how when we eat like uh, meat products, we always we can't eat like right after six or something with um, the f vegan. Can we like eat after nine or something like that? I say if you have a late day and you're active and you're hungry, that those rules can take a back seat. There's so many rules here. I, and that's what I, I really wanted to get uh, beyond, is there's so much freedom. There's no actual evidence in the science world that stopping eating at six makes it so that you lose weight faster. There isn't research like that. However, if we're used to eating a big meal at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, and we get up in the morning, we're so stuffed because we ate late, then we may not get a good enough breakfast. And by the time we get hungry, we might be out on the road somewhere. It's 10 o'clock. There's nothing to eat, but let's pull in and get the Reese's, whatever. That's the only danger I see of it. So does that help? 
Yeah, so it, there is, there's, isn't it interesting how many of those rules pop up from the past? And it's a whole new way of looking at that, of just, and, and this is where mindfulness comes in, because being mindful of our hunger and fullness signals and finding our natural, naturally healthy weight within that is a wonderful way to live. So, hope that sets your heart at ease a little bit. Wasn't there someone over oh, here? We are. Hi. I have a question about diabetes. Plant based is a wonderful way to help with diabetes, but my concern is I look at the rice and the grains and the beans, and you're like going, I'm, I can, you push that away because of the spikes that happen in your sugar. So, how do you get a complete? If you're a diabetic, yes, yes, and you're trying to watch all this. Yes, how good question. Work? Because traditionally, that's how it's been pressed in our culture, right? You have to give up on the sugars. But I would suggest to you a book called *Reversing Diabetes* by Dr. Neil Barnard, who we've already mentioned with a 21-day kickstart, because he will give you a very clear representation with the science of that it's not the sugars that are the problem; it's the fats on our body and in our diet that create a block in our body's ability to function correctly with insulin. So he says insulin is like this, you know, bus that has to take the sugar from your bloodstream and to put it into your muscles. Well, if or it's if you can't get through if there's a lot of slippery um, oil and fat, it doesn't allow for the uptake and he has done multiple research studies with diabetics losing weight and reversing and getting off their diet, their medications by eliminating animal protein, eliminating the fats, except for natural fats that come in whole foods, and focusing on the whole plant carbohydrates. I completely understand the question, but that book would be, rest your heart at ease. It would give you really something to go on. Um, did you want to, do you have that as a recommended reading in your um, nutrition we, class? I show videos that shows the, him speaking about the intermyocellular fat where the fat does just clog up the cells, and then when we can get that fat away, then the insulin can work and get the glucose in. And they've pitted the low-fat vegan diet, the whole food, plant-based diet, against the American Diabetes Association diet, and it wins hands down, feet down, everything down. No question, it reverses the diabetes. Yeah. So it's called reversing diabetes, Barnard, yeah. B-A-R-N-A-R-D. He has a great TED Talk, 17 minutes, it's all you need. Mm -hmm. if you. I'll email it to you. Oh, so you know. Oh, yes. Good. Good. Great questions. Anyone else? More questions. Yes. I was just wondering what snacks you have for like on the go stuff. Oh. You to take with you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And I address that a lot in the book, too, when it comes to Rockstar with being on the go. But, you know, when I was teaching school all that time, I would leave at school at s home at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'd be teaching all day. I'd teach fitness classes at night. And every morning, I would pack a bag that had... Um, Rice that I'd pull from the refrigerator, I always have brown rice in there, some beans, some vegetables, a salad, a couple sandwiches, a couple of pieces of fruit, and some raw vegetables. You can get coolers that are kind of um, unisex, you know, like the shoulder bag. Uh, it's just like a lunch bag, and you can pack that with foods that you really like. And if you need something that takes small space, you can do, I have a recipe before I called Speedy Burritos, which is just taking a wrap and wrapping it with beans and rice, and you can freeze them so that you can act in, in uh, parchment paper. So you could actually, you know, pop it into a microwave or let it thaw through the course of the day. But if, if you need hand food, sandwiches and fruit and all those kinds of things are good. Does that appeal to you? Yeah. What do you usually eat for on the go or just didn't know what to do? Yeah. Oh, and that's true. Nuts and seeds, and um, and those are very helpful too in dried fruit because they take up a lot of space. They're just kind of you don't want to do those solid because they're kind of calorific to just live on those things. But they're really good um, portable food, and they're durable. When I get on an airplane, I usually pack four hummus sandwiches. You guys know what hummus is, right? It's that. Um, because I f and t hummus and tomato and avocado for my husband Greg and I, and I figure over the course this is long international flights, so I figure and I always get through TSA with that. Nobody's ever stopped with that. I'll pack um, two to four peanut butter sandwiches because those are durable. We can eat those 48 hours later. They may be misshapen and banged up, <laughs> but they still can be eaten. I'll pack some fruit, and we only have to eat those before we get to international security somewhere. 
But those, the, the, you know, and carrots and um, sugar snap peas. So anyway, all those kinds of things. And I do address that a lot in the plant-based journey because that's a big one. We're so on the go. Yes. Sandwiches. Is there any type of bread or brand that you suggest? She asked if there's any particular kind of bread that I suggest. And there are sprouted grain breads, like Food for Life makes those, and I think Alvarado Street makes those. You can usually get them in the fresh or the freezer. Trader Joe's has a big, uh, round, whole grain demi panache or something. All it has is whole wheat flour, water, and salt in it. Um, I was just in Marin and got some whole wheat sourdough, so I, you know, I'll take any kind of bread. But if it's got, if you're looking at something that you want to have at whole grain, the first ingredient has to be whole ground wheat, not wheat flour, because that's usually white flour, and then they'll pepper, you know, throw a little grains in later. So, and if you're, if you're not gluten sensitive, in which most people aren't, you know, only a small percentage of people really do have that gluten sensitivity, but it, it, I also have something in the plant-based journey called the process continuum, so we can look at those things. Like, if we start with a whole grain, like a whole wheat grain, and the more it gets chopped up and refined, then we get down more and more to being more problematic for salt, satisfying our hunger without causing excess grain. So that was a long question, but do, any, do you recognize any of those brands of bread? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And by the way, I ate bread every day of my 50-pound weight loss. So, you know, I don't like to, to, maybe this helps, you know, people thinking, can't eat after this, can't eat any of that. It's, it's, it can change. If you get a lot of whole plant foods, you can really eat quite robustly without a problem. Yeah, good. I was wondering if you eat a bunch of fruits, do you have to have to worry about the sugar contents in it? Like you drink too much like uh, orange juice, grapefruit juice? Yeah, okay, he's asking if you have to worry about the sugar in fruits, but then he called it, you said juice. So I put those in kind of two different camps, and we we're talking about the processed continuum. When you have a whole fruit, like an orange, and you eat that, you get all of the fiber and all of the foods that come along with the juice that fill you up and allow a, sh a slow absorption of the sugar from the fruit. When you juice it, you toss out the fiber and a lot of the other friends, and it can cause a sugar surge in your body. Now, if you're running a race, if you're the marathoner or you're a kid that's running around all day and you need a quick shot of sugar, that might be appropriate to you. But this might interest you as well. Um, there was a study done with people eating at a food bar or a food buffet. And everyone got to eat ad libitum. That means as much as you want. With one group, they gave them 200 calories of orange juice first and then said, go ahead and, you know, eat from the food bar, same foods. And then this group did not have orange juice before the 200 calories of orange juice. Well, as a group, both groups ate the same amount of food from the food bar, but the orange juice gr group people had just had 200 more calories. That did not fill them up in any way, shape, form. It just gave them 200 more calories. So that's what we have to think about. When it comes in liquid calories, uh, it just adds to your calorie load without filling you up. And everyone has to find their own. Some people do well on a lot of fruit. Some people find maybe a little bit less. So does that help? Does that answer your question? Great question. I got to tell you, this is the best field of questions I've ever had. I just could spend all afternoon with you. Uh, what's your stance on GMOs? Ah, oh, what's my stance on GMO, GMOs? I, I think it is problematic because of, here's an example. Let me bring it to something really small, back to the broccoli. You've all heard of omega-3 fats? Has that been enough in the news that we know that we need those more omega-3s and less omega-6s? Well, as I understand it, Broccoli is very high in omega-3 fatty acids. We would never know it to look at it. It looks like it doesn't have any fat in it, but it's true. However, the GMO broccoli is devoid of omega-3 fatty acids. So this is like a, a small parcel of what could be going wrong with those. I think there's a lot of problems with big companies like Monsanto, which uh, ties in with the environmental questions. They're all huge. However, so I think it is a concern, but I want to qualify it with this. When people start derailing to the GMO question and the, um, the gluten question, and they get really tied up in those, I go, they're important issues, but let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. picture. 
I would rather have you eating a piece of broccoli from the market if you couldn't find the organic non-GMO one. I tell you why, I get people who go get so tense about this and they'll go, oh, but I couldn't find broccoli lo locally grown, non-GMO, organic, and it's like, you know, pff, who's gonna bother with that? Just start with the broccoli and then move on from there, or whatever vegetable, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> good question, I hope that helped. Any other questions, or is it time to sign books? Wow. Well, again, my pleasure. You have been fantastic, and look how long you stayed with me, and I so appreciate you've been very hospitable and full of all kinds of good things. So I will be out here answering more questions, or if you want to look through a book, I'll sign it for you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lanny. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic afternoon.